Hello everybody and welcome to Richard Coet's Stories on the Road this time. I'm not doing a reasonable rant today, I've got a couple stories to tell instead. Uh, namely in this video, the story of how I worked at the freaking Super Bowl. Yes, the Super Bowl, look at that. Yeah, how many people get to say that? About 3,000 people get to say that they worked in the Super Bowl in New York. <laughs> and I'm one of them. So for those of you who didn't know, I started work at New Metal End Stadium when it opened in 2010. So I've been there for about four years now, working at MetLife Stadium, essentially. And when the Super Bowl came around, everybody who was working at the stadium was eligible to uh, work the Super Bowl, and I did. Uh, the day began a lot earlier than you think. The day began at 8 a.m. for everybody who worked at the Super Bowl. Earlier for those who were supervisors and such. Uh, but this is not even to mention the days beforehand doing snow removal, of which I'm a snow removal team captain. Uh, the days prior, you know, getting rid of snow and such, and preparing, preparing, preparing for snow, and then suddenly it's, you know, 58 degrees outside the day of the Super Bowl. It was amazing. Uh, we begin the day by heading and parking at the off-site location where we are parked and then shuttled in. Mine happened to be Newark Airport. So I park in Newark Airport and we begin to get shuttled in. The shuttle line, the off-site location was handled, I'm not going to say miserably, but they were, <laughs> they underestimated. This is a common theme that you'll find out in this story, is a story of underestimation. They underestimated how much time it would take for all the employees to punch in and stuff. And so, the line of shuttle buses heading from uh, Newark Airport and the other off-site parking locations for employees basically had us waiting in line to get to the check-in place for around 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm sitting there trying to get people to sing the Banana Boat song, I'm sitting there talking to people about, you know, what the upcoming day is going to be like, the teams themselves, just trying to pass the time as best as we possibly could. Because we were sitting there for a damn long time. We get to the actual check-in place, and we got another 30 to 45 minutes of waiting. And we had it easy. We guest services folk skipped into our own separate line while all the Delaware North group people, Delaware North is the company who runs all the food stands at MetLife Stadium, they went into a separate line which was two to three times as long. <laughs> so we get there and we, and I'm basically, you know, in line, I'm Teach, I'm showing people how to uh, do a couple card tricks. I'm performing for them. I'm I'm playing Petals Around the Rose with them. If you ever see me and you don't know what Petals Around the Rose is, ask me to show you. Uh, <laughs> and it's just the most incredible thing. And we finally end up getting to the front of the line. And what happens at the front of the line is we get all this amazing free stuff. You know, normally MetLife Stadium is not, I mean, I'm not going to say they're bad at giving free stuff away to their employees, but we don't get anywhere near the amount of stuff that guests do to the, that comes to the games. Guess who comes to the games? Like, Jets will hand out towels, the Giants handed out playoff towels when they made their Super Bowl run recently. Uh, you know, just any number of things are given away at basically one out of every three or four games at MetLife Stadium. We received gloves, hat, earmuffs, our credentials. We received two different Super Bowl pins uh, and a couple other things that I actually can't remember. <laughs> uh, oh yes, we got special hand warmers uh, with MetLife Stadium em em emblazed all over them. <laughs> it seems like the silliest thing, but either way, we got so much good stuff that we were you know, able to wear there for the game and keep. And I love it, it's great. I wonder if I have one of the uh, gloves here. I think I do, but it turns out I don't. Oh well. So, once we get out of checkout, we're basically two hours into our shift already. And we get to the stadium. Now here, it's pretty easy. We just go in to our check-in locations at the stadium, we check into the stadium, we punch in, and then we're sitting around for like, three hours before they open up the, well not three hours, but they open up the gates about an hour after everyone shows up and uh, we're basically sitting there letting people slowly file in, which I love, I love that what happened there is that instead of, you know, at a normal NFL game, people will wait until one hour before the game to get into the actual stadium from the parking lots. 
If you ever go to an NFL game, I do not recommend that because that is exactly what everyone else does, and hence the pileup is massive. At the Super Bowl, everyone filed in evenly throughout the day. It was beautiful. Uh, but you know what happened before the game that really made my night absolutely one of a kind unique? Uh, I am posted at the SAP gate, the SAP gate. Uh, it is a gate uh, that is my regular posting. I'm posted on the plaza level at the escalators. If you ever go to a game at MedLife Stadium, come on over and say hi to me, especially if it's a Giants game, because that's where I'll be. I will be at the plaza escalators for the SAP gate. Eli Manning is there doing autographs and pictures. <laughs> it's great. And I'm sitting there just, you know, 10 yards away from him looking to go, eh, Eli. <laughs> pictures, things like that. I get a couple of myself, none with him, of course, but then what happens when the uh, scheduled picture time with Eli is over with, there are there is a security detail that is supposed to escort him up to his suite. They are new, or at least new to this section of the stadium. They don't know the way to get him to the suites. <laughs> I do. So completely, completely, none of this was planned out, nothing. They, I'm, I'm telling this lady who is going to be escorting Eli Manning, yeah, you just go into the guts of the stadium, you go this way until you reach the escalators and then you go right up and there it is. And, and she's like, okay, I can't keep this all in my head come with us <laughs> and to me this is this is equivalent to, to the time when I basically was backstage with Penn Jillette in Las Vegas uh, in the monkey room I'm sitting there leading the team escorting Eli Manning just literally two three feet away from me saying hi to the fans inside the guts of the stadium and stuff on his way to the suites and I mess it up <laughs> I not badly not badly at all I took an equally valid route that just happened to give Eli, uh, like, an extra 20, 20 feet or so into where the public is uh, standing and such. We lead him through no problem, though nothing happens, but either way, we, we skip the elevator he was supposed to go up and go to another elevator, an equally valid elevator that goes right up to the suites. That elevator just happens to be in public. <laughs> oh well. But the bottom line is, I freaking escorted Eli Manning up to his suites at his brother's second, or no, sorry, third Super Bowl. <laughs> I am one of three people in the world who can say that. Three people. It's incredible. I love it. Uh, <laughs> so after that happens, I go back downstairs, and uh, the game begins. And... I'm sitting there, and normally at my uh, Giants and Jets games, where my post is outside the SAP gate, I get to watch on the screens. Uh, they have uh, the outdoor pylons outside the stadiums, which shows the game actually being played as the game is being played for everybody who's outside having a smoke break. They don't show it. <laughs> they do not show the Super Bowl. I basically sat there trying to hear from fan chatter what was going on during the Super Bowl? I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. But it, what was great about it was that we had multiple breaks scheduled for the day. And two of the breaks uh, for me happened during the game. They happened <laughs> during the very first play of the game. I had, I was on break upstairs uh, on the top of the 100 concourse. And I watched the safety. And with my own eyes, I directly saw on the field happen. Then the second one, the second one, I walk right up to the same place to catch a glimpse of the game. The second, the next play turns out to be the pick six. <laughs> what, what luck, you know? And, I, and I'm a Seahawks fan too. My li my list for my NFL teams, by the way, if you're wondering, goes: I'm a Giants fan first, uh, Seahawks fan second. Then I'm a Steelers fan, a Dolphins fan, and a Jets fan as well. In that order. So to me, this was absolutely wonderful. Uh, we get to the end of the game, of course, and then it happens. If you read the reports or you were there, you know exactly what happened. The trains. They underestimated by about 50% the amount of people who were going to be taking the trains. 
The line is the biggest line I've ever seen in my life for anything. It was absolutely astounding how many people were online for the trains, and there were no trains moving. There were simply, hang on a second, I can't see the road. There we go. There were simply no trains moving throughout the entire thing. Uh, for an hour and a half or so, I'm sitting there after the game is over, dead tired, sore on my feet. My back hurts, everything hurts. I'm tired, I'm done, I'm exhausted. And there's people coming up to me asking, how the fuck do I get home? And I literally have no answer to them. And I asked my supervisor, because today I want to do an extra good job about things. I want to make sure that I have every single piece of information to me that I that is available to me. So I asked my supervisor, what are the options for people getting home? And he basically says, they leave the way they came in. That's basically the idea. The, there are no taxis allowed on site. No taxis. You need to go to Secaucus Junction, the the, plate, the spot where the train runs to, in order to get a taxi. The charter buses, only for the people who came on them. Nobody knew it was allowed on. So basically, so basically, for two hours, I'm sitting there having to answer people going, I'm sorry, you're screwed. Not in those words, obviously, but that's basically what I'm saying to people. I'm sorry, you're screwed. Uh, Take a seat wherever you'd like, you know, have a smoke, do whatever. You're screwed. So, that's that. Then, of course, that finally ends. Of course, it doesn't end before I leave. It, it's still going on that people are there waiting in line by the thousands when I get the call to punch out and go home. So I punch out. I walk all the way across to where the shuttle is for the employees to get back to our lots. There are, now let me say again, there are two or three different locations where people are parked for the employees. One is Newark Airport, another one is uh, Secaucus Junction, another one is Manalapan, I believe it was. The Manalapan buses are running just fine. The Secaucus buses are running just fine. They've got enough buses because it's a short enough trip. Uh, granted, the lines for them are still long because, again, we had like 3,000 employees or more all jumping on the buses at the same time. So the line for them was horrifying. The line for Newark Airport bus was even more horrifying. It was, Jesus. Uh, we're basically sitting there almost rioting at this point because we ended up waiting uh, between the amount of time it took the bus to get from the pickup spot to our to our parking spaces at Newark Airport and the amount of time we spent waiting for those buses uh, where Newark Airport what essentially happened with the Newark Airport buses is there were too many or too few of them and they underestimated how long it would take to travel between Newark Airport and the uh, stadium so the buses were traveling essentially in a block going uh, to the airport and then back from the airport. There was a giant, there was a space where, you know, the buses were arriving one every five minutes. It was no problem at all. And then all of a sudden they would hit the end of the, of the amount of buses that they had and it, there would just be no buses for like a half hour. So the amount of time total before, between my punch out and getting to my car was two freaking hours. Two hours. At this point it's 2 a.m. And I'm only just driving home. <laughs> I've been there since 8. I've, I left my house at a little before 8 a.m. <coughs> I'll let that sink in. I worked from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. And I didn't get home until 3 or so. So I'll let you sink that in. Luckily, you know... The, the riot never happened among the employees or the or the fans waiting for the shuttle or for the train and the uh, and the uh, people at HR when we called them thankfully said you're getting paid for an extra three hours of travel time do not worry and I'm like okay thank you very much I ended up making around four hundred dollars for working the Super Bowl and I have stories that will last me a lifetime so that's what happened at Super Bowl number 48 in New York, New Jersey, MetLife Stadium, Richard Coat. <laughs> once in a lifetime, I escorted Eli Manning up to his suites 
for the Super Bowl. How's it done? <laughs> you can't get much luckier than that. Either way, that's the end of the story. Thank you very much. This has been Richard Cole Stories on the Road. I will see you all when I see you. Bye-bye!